Uh, let me begin by asking if anyone has any questions from before the break. You afraid to ask? <laughs> Okay, well then let's go on. Uh, having uh, delineated what the special benefits of private ownership of the means of production are, namely uh, the ability to consume a part of the profit and interest and the psychological potential of uh, being able to consume the capital should you need to, and which generally you don't, almost always you wouldn't. And uh, having shown uh, how uh, small the uh, personal consumption of the significant size businessmen and capitalists is in the overall scheme of things on the order of uh, maybe 10% of total consumption or at most 10% of national income. Uh, in the light of, of these facts, uh, one can uh, form a different evaluation of the whole philosophy of the redistribution of wealth and income. Uh, if you listen to the redistributors, uh, the picture they like to paint, you can actually see this practically literally in some of their cartoons. On the one side, there's the starving worker, or uh, the starving welfare recipient. Uh, he has three beans on his plate. Uh, elsewhere, there's this mammothly fat capitalist, and uh, as he's portrayed, uh, he has uh, an enormous barn full of food. And the redistributors uh, make it appear that all that they want to do is uh, take some of the uh, superfluity from the capitalist and put it on the plate of the starving worker. That's what redistributionism is all about. Well, uh, am I misrepresenting them? They have no conception that the wealth of the capitalist is in the form of capital, that it's in the means of production. It's not in his pantry, uh, in his uh, uh, closet, uh, in his garage. Uh, it's in uh, factories, machines, uh, mines, farms, whatever. Uh, it's not in uh, his personal consumer goods. Now, uh, the redistributors are oblivious to this, that they have no knowledge of capital or the role it plays in production. Uh, they just think it's a heap of wealth available to be consumed by the poor. And this is why uh, I make this statement in point B, uh, an open demand for capital decumulation and impoverishment. What would be the effect of attempting to redistribute capital in order to uh, provide for consumption of anybody, whether it's poor or, or not? It would be capital decumulation. Uh, we could, you know, the, the capital goods are wearing out, they're getting used up, they're wearing out. Uh, we continually have to produce capital goods uh, just to replace the capital goods being used up and worn out. But uh, for a brief time, we could get away without replacing them, uh, we could have a larger production of consumers' goods. But what would be the effect after uh, the existing capital goods started wearing out and we were no longer replacing them? What would then be the effect on our ability to produce and our standard of living? It would uh, very severely drop. Now, uh, this, uh, the, the policy of redistributionism is essentially a policy of eating the seed corn. Uh, they want to uh, have uh, a uh, one-shot increase in consumption at the expense of the ability to have future production. Now, uh, if it were not such a demand, uh, maybe I need to back up here to point A, uh, when we take into account uh, that the wealth of the businessmen and capitalists is overwhelmingly in the means of production, well, what does that imply about the extent to which uh, the non-owners are already benefiting? How much further benefit could they possibly have? <coughs> They're getting the benefit of the capitalist capital in producing the products they buy, in demanding the uh, labor services they sell. Uh, what more uh, 
conceivably could the capitalists do? And to what extent could they increase the general benefit coming from their wealth? Is there anyone who has more capital? All right, if they uh, reduced their consumption and saved and invested more. But uh, what would be the absolute maximum amount that they could do that uh, if, if it's the case that already uh, their consumption is only on the order of 10% uh, of uh, total income in the economy? Something less than that 10%. If, if they consume nothing at all, if they consume nothing at all, how much could they increase the amount of consumers' goods available for the rest of the population? If they're consuming to begin with, 10% uh, of the total consumption. 10%. Well, then they could add, uh, their 10% could be added on to the others 90%, so there'd be a one-shot, uh, non-repeatable increase of one-ninth, 11 and a ninth percent. Now, uh, when you listen to the redistributors and they're uh, talking about well, 10% uh, of the people own 90% of the wealth or whatever, uh, what is it that they're projecting? Are they projecting that uh, we'll have this great, glorious redistribution of wealth and income and we'll succeed in increasing the consumption of the average person in the economy uh, by one-ninth? Is that what their program uh, projects itself as? No, but that would be the limit of it uh, if you wanted to avoid uh, capital decumulation. So this whole program of redistributionism, uh, they're urging people uh, to shed rivers of blood uh, for a more just distribution. If they could get everything that they don't already have, they already have the benefit of the overwhelming bulk of the capitalist wealth in the means of production. The only thing they don't have is what the capitalists personally consume. And that, in the great scheme of things, is very small. There isn't very much to gain, even if you could get it. Uh, but the fact that they think it's so uh, uh, huge, well, the only thing that's huge is the capital, and that's what they're out to consume. Now, I hasten to point out that, uh, and this is uh, now in point six, uh, that uh, on the one side, uh, well, uh, I guess uh, 5C, uh, if it isn't, a, if redistributionism were not to be a demand for capital decumulation, then at most it would amount to uh, a one-time, non-repeatable transfer of something on the order of 10% of national income. That would be the most that they could obtain uh, without capital decumulation. And now notice that if we have a free economy, if we have capitalism, uh, if economic progress is going on, at the rate of uh, merely 2% a year, how long does it take uh, for the average real income to be increased 10%? Well, what number times two equals 10? Five. Okay, five years. So if we had economic progress, at the rate of 2% a year, actually even in a little bit less than five years, uh, you'd have an improvement equal to the maximum that could conceivably be accomplished by redistribution. And then you could have this benefit over and over and over again with further economic progress. Now, uh, and now we're in uh, point six, consequences of redistributionism. Uh, in reality, the, the redistributors could not achieve uh, the one-shot transfer. Uh, they could not, in fact, uh, succeed in gaining that 10% or whatever uh, if they attempted to do that. Because suppose they enacted legislation uh, to achieve that. Suppose Ralph Nader were elected president of the United States. It's very unlikely, fortunately. But uh, he has said at one time or another, I don't know just how recently, that uh, the maximum income uh, should be 10 times the minimum wage. So the highest paid uh, executives, uh, the wealthiest capitalists, uh, should not be allowed to have an, an after-tax income uh, more than 10 times that of the lowest paid wage earners. Maybe he's modified the figure, but he has said that, and that's uh, the way his thinking runs. Uh, there have been other people with similar uh, uh, programs. 
Many years ago, uh, the uh, head of the United Automobile Workers Union was a man named Walter Ruther, and he and Eleanor Roosevelt uh, uh, were both urging a limitation of uh, after-tax income uh, to $25,000 a year. Now, in today's terms, that would actually be more generous than uh, Nader's uh, 10 times the minimum wage, because you'd have to multiply the 25,000 perhaps by 20 uh, to keep a, to keep pace with inflation, so uh, they would have allowed, in today's terms, uh, perhaps a half a million dollars a year uh, maximum after-tax income. Well, imagine uh, we had such a law that uh, taxes would be such that uh, nothing would remain after taxes beyond uh, perhaps half a million. And there'd be a lot of people who'd say, "Well, I don't make half a million. That's okay with me. Uh, won't won't affect me." Well, uh, what do you think the effect would be on people uh, who are busy accumulating uh, vast personal fortunes, 10 million, 100 million, a billion? If it were the case that the maximum income anyone could have after taxes would be a half a million dollars, and this were going to remain in force indefinitely, uh, then what would, it be, what would be the effect on uh, anyone uh, seeking to accumulate more than that amount of capital that would be sure to yield a half a million in income. Why would anyone want to do it? Now, if the uh, uh, rate of return were uh, five percent, then uh, you'd have a half a million income on ten million of capital. Uh, if you want absolute insurance, maybe you'd have an incentive to accumulate as much as twenty million of capital. But would anyone have the incentive uh, to develop a, a major company? in today's terms. No. no. Now, what effect would that have on the economic system? <laughs> uh, you wouldn't have any development. You'd, you'd be canceling out a major uh, uh, fraction of economic progress. Uh, all the economic progress that depends on people uh, being able to accumulate uh, vast personal fortunes and uh, build up the companies and industries in the process, that would be gone. And what about uh, people who had already accumulated such capitals? Uh, imagine here we are, we have somebody like Gates. At last report, he was worth about 40 plus billion dollars. Well, uh, if it were the case that uh, the only part of his capital that he could personally benefit from would be uh, 20 million, uh, if having uh, all of the, the 43 billion minus the 20 million, if the income on that uh, can't go to him, it's all taxed away. Well, what difference does it make to him whether he would have 43 billion or 20 million? None. 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 So, uh, uh, generalize this, what would be the effect on the incentive uh, to maintain and manage capital? It would be largely wiped out. Uh, what would be the effect of that on production? It would be radically reduced and I would think uh, to a far greater extent than the 10% gained uh, by redistribution. To whatever, whatever the redistributors might possibly hope to gain uh, through raising taxes in this way uh, would be far more than lost uh, in the uh, decrease in production. So uh, uh, this would be an entirely self-destructive policy. And if you think about the consequences of the loss of the incentive uh, to uh, maintain or manage capital, what do you think the government would be doing? Uh, suddenly would wake up and people would be complaining. Uh, there'd be whines on CBS and in the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. Uh, the businessmen don't care what's happening to their investments. Uh, no one is giving a damn anymore. Uh, they're walking away. Uh, why did this happen? Uh, and what do you think the remedy would be? So, so. Yeah, the government would then have to, to step in and take over. So uh, this would be a formula for uh, socialism. Now, uh, just a uh, last uh, few words on the lesser case of isolated nationalized industries. Isolated uh, nationalized <coughs> industries. Uh, it's very common uh, for uh, propagandists of, uh, of socialism uh, to uh, try to uh, rally support uh, for such things. Uh, by uh, telling people, well, this is ours. Uh, up in Canada, for example, uh, I believe that uh, 
there is a government-owned uh, oil company uh, that has uh, gas stations as one of its subsidiaries. I, I forget the name, but maybe some of you know. I don't think it's been privatized, but it, maybe it might have been. Uh, at any rate, uh, not many years ago, uh, there was a major uh, oil company uh, in Canada uh, that owned uh, many gas stations, and the uh, propaganda of the government was well, these are our gas stations. The average Canadian, that belongs to him. That's great, so uh, he should be sure to patronize uh, something that is his. Well, the post office in the same sense is ours, and Amtrak is ours, and so on. And uh, I would ask you to consider uh, where uh, do you have a better experience in, in going uh, into the uh, post office that is supposedly yours, or uh, dealing with FedEx or some other outfit uh, that in, you, in which you don't own a single share of stock. Where do you get better service? FedEx. I would say from FedEx, you get much better service uh, from a privately owned airline than from the government's Amtrak, even though you don't own a single share of stock or uh, a single uh, bond. Now, why is that? Somebody owns it. Uh, somebody owns it, and the private owners know that if they serve people better, they'll have more business and get better profits. If they serve them poorer, they'll have less business and earn lower profits or have losses. So you have a profit-loss incentive. And uh, there is freedom of competition in these lines. If a given firm is not doing as well as it might, uh, others uh, are free to step in and do the job better. And anyone anywhere in the whole economy could potentially enter any of these lines. Anyone who can think of a better way to do it is free to enter and shake up the industry. Where the government is in control, there are no profit and loss incentives. There is no threat of competition. The competition is either outright prohibited, uh, as in the case of the delivery of first class mail. Uh, it's against the law for any private carrier uh, to carry first class mail over post roads. And these are uh, most of the uh, key streets and roads in the country. So uh, you're not able to deliver uh, private first class mail. And even if there is no outright prohibition, uh, if the government enterprises are subsidized uh, out of, by the taxpayers and can sell their products at a loss, like the public education system, then even if someone has a much better product, uh, they have to compete with a competitor who is in a position uh, to sell the product at a loss or give it away for free. Uh, that rules out uh, most competition, or all competition sometimes. And uh, so uh, you lack uh, the profit and loss incentives where you have uh, government ownership. Uh, you lack profit and loss incentives. You lack the uh, freedom of competition and the uh, freedom of initiative uh, that goes with the freedom of competition. Well, I would say if you put all this together, uh, while uh, technically, uh, uh, if the government owns something, uh, we as citizens of the country might be described as equal uh, one 284th millionth uh, owners, so there are 284 million citizens of the U.S., uh, then theoretically, each of them is a one 284th uh, millionth owner uh, of all the government's assets. Uh, that does you no economic good of any kind. Your ownership, alleged ownership, merely serves to deprive you of the benefit of profit and loss incentives when you deal with these outfits, of the freedom of competition and the freedom of individual initiative. You are much, much better off not being an owner and having an arrangement whereby those who are the owners have the profit loss incentive, are subject to competition and uh, the initiative of other people. And then finally, uh, your ownership of government enterprises uh, does not uh, give you uh, the special benefits that uh, owners, the true owners receive, uh, such as the ability to consume a part of the earnings and the potential of being able uh, to consume the capital. Uh, when was the last time any of you got a dividend check from the post office or Amtrak? <laughs> Uh, never in anyone's lifetime. Uh, there is no uh, uh, addition. There is no income that you might consume. Uh, they don't have uh, income. 
and uh, do you have any kind of nest egg in your share of the ownership of these government assets? Could you say, well, if I get a serious illness, I know one of the things I'll do, I'll sell my shares in the post office. <laughs> no, you are born with those shares, you'll die with them. Uh, they cannot be alienated. So they do not provide the special benefit of ownership uh, that a private owner of the means of production would obtain. Uh, you have no special benefits, and uh, there are certainly no, uh, the, the, the general benefits are uh, far, far less uh, than would be the case if these outfits were privatized and operated uh, under the profit motive. Yes, Mr. Levy. So in your view, what was the rationale behind the privatization of the mail system in the, the U.S.? The privatization or the, the nationalization? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, why does the government have a <coughs> postal monopoly? Uh, I'm not uh, really sure why they do. Uh, they, they established a post office early on. Uh, there were uh, private post offices of one kind or another, like the Pony Express was a private post office. Yeah, I'm uh, just curious as to what, why the market forces didn't, didn't prove to be the winning hand in that case. They say why market forces didn't prove to be the winning hand. We're just following your theory through, right? That, uh, yes, there are things that can be done that uh, can stop the market from working. Uh, for example, if you ask the exact same question, why is it that we've had a nationalization of passenger railroads? At one time, uh, all of the passenger railroads in the United States were privately owned. Now, uh, how did we get uh, to the government coming to own them? Well. Uh, first, uh, many years ago, back in the late 19th century, uh, the government established the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, early on, the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, gained the power uh, to regulate railroad rates. Uh, then, somewhat later, uh, I would think perhaps by the time of World War I, uh, the railway unions were, in, were formed and uh, the railroads had to recognize them and deal with them. Uh, now, imagine you have an industry where the government is setting your rates and you have to deal uh, with a powerful uh, cluster of labor unions who are driving up your costs uh, through uh, higher wage demands and uh, grossly inefficient work rules. Uh, you know, uh, around in the early 20th century, uh, the trains went at about 25 miles an hour. And so uh, a full working day uh, would mean you traveled maybe 200, 250 miles. And then years later, uh, the speed of the trains has greatly increased, but the, the unions are able to consider that uh, 200 or 250 miles, that's a full day's work. So if you're traveling uh, 500 miles in that time, you have to pay a doubled salary, and of course at a much higher rate. So now, if you have a situation where the government is uh, setting rates and at the same time allowing your costs to be driven up, what is happening to your profitability? It's getting wiped out, right? And then people say, ah, the market has failed. Private enterprise had a chance, can't work. Well, is that a chance? No. No, it isn't. That's a, a stacked deck. Now, I don't know the particulars of the uh, post office situation. Uh, there may be some other considerations. Like if we had a uh, private uh, postal service, uh, there would be much higher rates uh, to uh, small population areas in, uh, in remote locations. Uh, if, uh, if someone has to drive a, a truck uh, 20 miles to deliver five letters, uh, that can only be done at a much, much higher cost. And so a private operation would be charging uh, radically different rates on mail delivery uh, depending on uh, such factors as uh, the population concentration, uh, the distance to, to make a delivery. Uh, you wouldn't be able to have a system where everybody anywhere in the country uh, can mail a letter of a given size uh, for the same price. And uh, there are a lot of people who are upset with the, that prospect, uh, being, with that being lost. Can I just make sure I'm understanding you right on the rail example? So it was, it, it was a concert of price regulation yeah. with unions that forced that basically demolished the market. So that wiped out profitability. Wiped out profitability. Yeah. So the government came in to rescue and then nationalized? Well, yeah, in these circumstances, imagine you're the owner of such, you're the owner of a railroad. You have a lot of stock in a railroad. Uh, if you keep operating, each year you have huge losses. 
and you see no way of stopping that because the legislation is not going to change. In those circumstances, uh, the lesser evil will appear to be the government coming in and buying you out. The government can buy you out at a much better price uh, than the capitalized value of uh, future losses. And we have uh, a repetition of the same thing uh, closer at hand. Uh, we had uh, uh, rate control on uh, uh, retail electric utility rates. And uh, the, the government uh, imposed these rate controls on the uh, retail sale of power, uh, still calling it decontrol. The press keeps calling it decontrol, even though the rates are controlled. Uh, where they didn't have control was on the wholesale price of power. And the uh, power companies were obliged to uh, supply whatever power the consumers demanded at the controlled prices. And so Pacific Gas and Electric was driven into bankruptcy. Uh, Southern California Edison uh, was very close to bankruptcy. Now, in this environment, uh, don't you think uh, there'd be a lot of potential there for the uh, California power companies to think that uh, it's a good solution for the state of California to take over their power, their, their power facilities? And they, they might uh, work for such legislation because it's the lesser evil. But uh, what creates this situation and where people are saying, oh, the, the market doesn't work? The government sabotages the market, then it doesn't work. Well, I can't say that I, I, have, I need to brush up on my rail history, but I, I'm curious as to why companies such as the BNSF, the freight rails, but, yeah. all survived and the passenger lines were the ones that were privatized. No, nationalized. Na I'm sorry. Yeah. I have to get that. Uh, why why the uh, freight railroads remain private rather than right. uh, and not the passenger railroads? Because aren't they subject to the same constraints of the unions? Uh, they have the same problems, uh, but then uh, the passenger railroads have additional problems, uh, the, the competition of the automobile too. So they have that added factor. Now, uh, the freight railroads, of course, have truck competition. Uh, maybe there are further differences. It's a good question uh, why uh, would the freight railroad survive. I would think perhaps uh, it's quite possible that uh, uh, the rate control was easier on the uh, freight railroads because uh, who pays the freight rates? Uh, it's business firms, right? And uh, how many votes are at stake? You see, suppose uh, uh, in one context uh, the railroads want to raise their freight rates 10%. In another, they'd like to raise the passenger rates 10%, uh, which would produce more angry letters to Congress. Passenger. The passenger rates. So I would expect that uh, those rates would be more tightly controlled, uh, causing greater losses. Uh, maybe the freight rates are were more easily adjusted uh, to reflect higher costs. But that's a good question. Yes. Uh, so going back to the post office example, you know, there is no incentive for the private companies. Excuse me? You know, going back to the post office example, yeah. you know, there is no incentive for the private companies to go and serve uh, no man's will, you know, where people of 100 or 200 people. Mm -hmm. you know, there is no incentive for them to go and serve because probably they will be operating at a loss. So in such cases, the government has to step in and provide such services, right? Well, no, they, could, uh, provide, they could provide the service. Uh, they could have... Uh, Relative, they have, wouldn't have to, probably might not have daily mail delivery. I don't know. Well, they could have daily mail delivery if people would pay a price high enough to cover the costs plus a competitive rate of return. So if if it works out to cost uh, a dollar for the same letter that normally would cost thirty seven cents, well, uh, they'll pr deliver the mail if the price they can obtain does cover all of the costs plus make an allowance for a competitive rate of profit that will be delivered. Uh, it won't be delivered if people are not willing to pay that price. So uh, you could have it, and uh, people could make an alternative arrangement. They could say, OK, uh, we'll take a, a post office box in the nearest, more significant sized town, and we'll drive in once a week or, or whatever and collect our mail. But the alternative is, uh, you see, uh, uh, people are often viewing it as uh, the mail recipient has a kind of God-given right to get his mail at a low price. And the government must comply and give it to him. But what that means is uh, someone is saying, I have a right to cheap mail delivery, and therefore you have to pay higher taxes to make that possible.
They just need to travel outside of this country to have Pardon that. Me? They just need to travel outside of this country to have that reality dispelled. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Every other, well, not every other country, but, you know, okay, example, my wife's from Brazil. Yeah. And the reliance that there's no preconceived notion like the one you just described in Brazil. Uh -huh. There is a total lack of faith in the system, so I think it, that's a very American and perhaps European view of being able to trust that infrastructure and have a certain degree of reliance. Well, uh, it's a, I think it's a lucky break for mail to get through in many countries. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the only way you can send mail reliably to Mexico, I think, is if it's registered. So uh, it's true that the mail system doesn't work at all in many countries. And the government, of course, is the owner. Uh, here, the, the government post office is much better uh, than in these other countries. But not nearly as good as a private mail service could be. Uh, you go to a post office, uh, you'll almost always, right, at least 60% of the time, you'll have to spend half an hour waiting in line uh, to, to get someone to make a simple transaction. Okay, uh, the net upshot of all of this, uh, the conclusion, uh, as I put it, is uh, that the institution of private ownership of the means of production is in the material self-interest of everybody. It serves everyone, not only the owners, but the great mass, all of the non-owners as well. And if people understood their actual economic self-interest, everybody would be in favor of private ownership of the means of production even though you're not an, an owner of means of production, uh, just being able to buy the products that you want and being able to sell your labor on good terms. If people look at it that way, then everybody should want private ownership of the means of production. It's in the self-interest of everybody. But you see, the prevailing, view, uh, the prevailing view is that we are locked into a system of class warfare. The prevailing view is there's two basic classes. There's the uh, small minority of capitalists, and then there's the immense majority of wage earners. And capitalism alleg allegedly is functioning only in the self-interest of this narrow minority of capitalists, uh, ignoring the interests or opposing the interests of the great mass of wage earners. And I'm sorry to tell you, this is the mentality of the Democratic Party today, and also of many Republicans, too. They think we have this uh, narrow elite of rich, high-income people. Uh, they're the only ones who benefit from, uh, I have to say, a more liberal economic policy, a freer economic policy. And it has uh, no benefit uh, for the masses of people. Uh, they suffer by it. Am I doing uh, uh, the, most of the Democrats an injustice in saying that this is their philosophy? I think it is accurate. You can pick it up in the daily papers or on, or on television. Hardly anybody has the conception that capitalism is a system that functions in the self-interest of everybody. That you don't have to be a capitalist uh, to benefit from capitalism. Is there such a thing as a middle ground, though? Because in your argument, I'm having trouble seeing the middle ground. It seems to be one extreme or the other. Well, you see, there's a law of logic called the law of the excluded middle. And sometimes we have conditions where it's either or. Now, you cannot have uh, private ownership of the means of production and public ownership of the means of production at the same time and in the same respect. You have can to I make phrase, a choice. Can I phrase, a, can I phrase it differently? Then? Yeah. Can you have institutionalized social, well, I don't want to use the word socialized because it's not what I'm trying to capture, but institutionalized humanitarian beliefs to your structure that aren't necessarily strictly market forced. Can you have uh, uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian aspects, humanitarian institutions uh, that uh, are not uh, governed by the profit motive? Yes. Yes, you could. Anyone is legally free to start any kind of charity he wants to, raise funds for it, uh, provide funding. People do that. That's fine. But you have to recognize that uh, that can never be a major solution uh, to the problem of poverty. Uh, there's a very limited amount of, uh, of charity that people are willing to give. I think most people would be willing or are willing to give something, but uh, it undergoes diminishing marginal utility. And uh, maybe uh, there are people who will be willing to give 5% of their income, 10%, 
but I don't think many people would be willing to give more than that. And, but that uh, can't solve uh, the global problems of poverty. Uh, the real solution for poverty, that people are, are truly humanitarians, uh, the best thing that real humanitarians could do, I think, is understand economic theory. And then they would know what the institutions make it possible for countries to become prosperous and for the whole problem of poverty to be minimized. All right, let me turn uh, to a major implication of the discussion we've had, uh, and this concerns the institution of inheritance. It's uh, very similar to the whole discussion of private ownership of the means of production. Again, uh, there's a very similar prevailing view, and this is that when it comes to inheritance, uh, the only people who gain from the institution are the heirs, and that the non-heirs uh, gain nothing uh, from the institution of inheritance, uh, that in fact uh, their interests lie uh, with a policy of confiscating the inheritances and redistributing them. Am I misstating things? Uh, a couple of years back, uh, I forget precisely how many, uh, the inheritance taxes were reduced. Uh, I don't know what we're, uh, what the uh, prevailing rate is. Does anyone here know? It went from 55% to 47% on a reduced scale. The inheritance tax is still 47%? On a marginal level, yes. Does that conform with everybody's understanding? That seems high well, to that's me. That's what I do for a living, so you can oh, yeah? put it up in the tax rates if you want. But that's what the market 47% on uh, what, at what level? It's over 3 million right now. Over 3 million? And what is the exemption? One and a half million. One and a half, oh, so there's a and a half an exemption. exemption. Okay, and, uh, and there was some special uh, provision enacted that's supposed to expire in a few years. 2010. Uh, and what provision is that? The sunset provision. Yeah, pre that, what's, what, what does it specifically refer to? What are, you, are, are you asking what happens in 2010? No, I'm asking uh, what, what uh, favorable, relatively favorable tax rate is set to expire? They made some uh, reduction it goes on a temporary. Back to the laws as they were in 2000, I think. either 2000 or 97. There were two reductions: one under Bush and one under Bush. Okay, and what what did the first reduction reduce it from? It to? goes back to a million. At, at January one of 2011, it goes back to a million dollar um, exemption equivalent, which is a tax credit of 345. Uh, okay, so there's a million up to a million. You pay no inheritance tax. And what was the rate of tax uh, prior to the Clinton reduction? It went up to 55% and you had a $600,000. Okay, 55% uh, uh, was, where, where did the, that maximum come in, at three million? Yes. Okay, so any inheritance above three million, they would tax 55%. Now you say until 2011 or so, it's uh, 47%. It keeps reducing down each year. By then it'll be like 45 or 45. Okay, so it's set to go down to 45 or 44 percent. So it's at a higher rate than uh, the highest personal income surtax. Correct. Okay. I, well, uh, I didn't realize that the rates were still this high. I thought they had been brought down. But uh, this uh, shows you uh, the seriousness of the issue. And the reason we have such taxes is it's thought that uh, the only people who benefit uh, from inheritance are uh, those fortunate enough to be heirs. Uh, no one else has anything to gain from inheritance, except possibly uh, seeing the inheritances taxed and uh, uh, dispersed uh, for the general good. I think that's how uh, people view it. Well, if uh, we look at inheritances in the light of our discussion of the uh, general benefits from private ownership of the means of production, all we have to do is realize that uh, the ability to transmit wealth to heirs serves to increase the amount of capital accumulated. So you just think, uh, uh, why is it that people uh, don't uh, consume all the wealth they've earned in their lifetimes? They want to leave some for the next generation? And they want to leave some. It's a powerful reason uh, to make provision for children and grandchildren. It's not universal, but uh, many, many people are concerned uh, to leave something uh, for their children and grandchildren. Now, uh, if we uh, 
prevent them from doing that, though to the extent we do, what happens to the amount of wealth that will be accumulated and transmitted? Less. It is less. Now, uh, if uh, we had 100% taxation of inheritances, which is where the, the logic of the redistributors would lead, uh, then uh, people would uh, either consume all that they've earned and most probably earn less. Uh, see, why bother to earn money uh, that uh, you're not able to, to save and, and, and transmit for future uses? Uh, you'd be undercutting not only the incentive to uh, save, but the incentive to earn funds uh, too, to an important degree. Now, let's say that nevertheless, uh, people have accumulated money, uh, they're dying, and uh, their estates uh, fall under the inheritance tax. Okay, the heirs will have to sell a part of the estate uh, to raise taxes, uh, to, to get the money to pay the taxes. Uh, people have to buy the parts of the estates that they're liquidating. Now, if we had not had the inheritance tax, uh, the people who are buying the estates that the heirs are forced to liquidate, they would have to buy additional capital assets. They'd be accumulating additional capital wealth. Uh, we would have uh, the transmitted uh, inheritances and new and additional wealth as well. Instead, with the inheritance tax, uh, new current savers are buying uh, previously accumulated estates, and then the sellers of these estates, what are they doing with the money? Well, they're paying the taxes, and then what does the treasury do with the money? It consumes it. So what is the effect on capital accumulation? There's less capital accumulation. If there's less capital accumulation, what is the effect on the supply of products available for the general consuming public to buy? Let's reduce. What's the effect on the demand for labor that they're selling? Reduce. Okay, well, is it then, uh, in, is it true that uh, the only people who have an interest in the institution of inheritance are the heirs? No. No. Rightly understood, it's to everybody's self-interest that people should be free uh, to bequeath their wealth to their heirs. Because the consequence is there is more capital accumulation, significantly more capital accumulation, by recognizing and protecting the institution of inheritance. And so even though uh, I never expect to inherit anything, I think the total that I ha ever have inherited is about $5,000 or thereabouts. So uh, I'm not a significant heir, but uh, I'm uh, totally opposed to the inheritance tax. Uh, uh, not just, uh, well, I, I could offer my own material self-interest, but it's the material self-interest of everybody. If, if it's true that everyone's material self-interest depends on the accumulation of capital to supply products and to demand labor, then everybody should be opposed to any form of tax that uh, reduces the available supply of capital. And the inheritance tax is uh, such a tax par excellence. Now, uh, the, same, the same point about capital accumulation, uh, this applies uh, to practically all taxation of uh, profits and interest and any kind of uh, direct tax on capital. Uh, just think, uh, well, the point number one here is as far as the taxes uh, come out of capital uh, or out of uh, what would have been added to capital, to the extent that taxes are paid either directly out of existing capital or out of uh, funds that otherwise would have been saved and added to capital, they're reducing and holding down the demand for labor and capital goods. That's the effect of these taxes. And the further effect is, if the demand for labor is held down, what's the effect on wage rates? They're held down. And what's the effect on the demand for capital goods relative to the demand for consumers' goods? If we're undercutting the demand for capital goods, if we're taxing away funds that would have been spent buying capital goods and using those funds to allow the government or people whom the government supports to consume, what are we doing to the demand for capital goods relative to the demand for consumers' goods? We're reducing it. And we're reducing uh, the production of capital goods relative to the production of consumers' goods. What does that do to our ability to accumulate capital? 
that holds it down. What's that do to the level of the productivity of labor and real wages? It undercuts that. Now, uh, these are the effects not just of inheritance taxes, but uh, of a wide variety of other taxes, uh, starting with the corporate income tax. Uh, imagine for the moment that corporations did not have to pay the corporate income tax. What would they be doing uh, with the funds they had been paying in taxes and no longer had to? They would very heavily be reinvesting. Uh, they would be able to construct new factories, uh, buy new equipment. Now, to some extent, they could pay higher dividends. But then, uh, what would the recipients of these dividends be doing to a large degree? Uh, saving and reinvesting. Uh, we'd have uh, investment going on outside the corporations that uh, had uh, transmitted the dividends. Now, uh, the same thing applies uh, to, the, to the progressive personal income tax. Uh, and uh, particularly at the higher brackets, and there are a number of reasons, uh, there are a number of reasons why uh, 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 inc higher incomes are more heavily saved and invested. This is something that uh, has been widely observed uh, statistically. So uh, empirically, I don't think there's much issue about it, that uh, people earning higher incomes tend to uh, save a much larger proportion. But uh, there are solid reasons. It's not just a random observation. Uh, one reason uh, has been uh, developed by uh, Milton Friedman, whom I assume you've all heard of. Uh, he had what he called the permanent income hypothesis. Uh, suppose we have people like uh, star athletes, uh, uh, movie stars, uh, best-selling authors. Uh, they're making a huge income, uh, but only for a short period of time. They can't count on earning such a stupendous income indefinitely. All right, what must they do if they want to benefit from their very high incomes of a limited span uh, over their lifetimes? They have to save and invest uh, the greater part of those incomes. So that's one element. Uh, then uh, there's another, which I think is, is more important even. Uh, the, the way that uh, people build great fortunes is they start off uh, with a relatively uh, small amount of capital on which they earn a high rate of profit. But they have to save and reinvest the far greater part of that high profit uh, to increase their capital. And then hopefully they can continue to earn that high rate of profit on a bigger capital. Uh, imagine, uh, suppose we started, uh, someone begins with $100,000. And uh, the objective is uh, to grow this 100000 into a billion uh, within uh, a certain span of years, say 20 years. Well, in order for 100000 to grow to a billion within 20 years, uh, there's some definite compound annual rate of growth that's required. I don't know off the top of my head precisely what it would be. Uh, but let's say it's 40% uh, 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 annual uh, growth. Well, uh, what this means is uh, to actually grow from 100,000 to a billion, uh, you might have to earn uh, a rate of profit, let's say, of uh, 50% uh, per year, uh, out of which you would save and reinvest uh, uh, 80%. If you can earn a 50% rate of profit and save and reinvest 80%, uh, that will give you a 40% compound annual rate of growth. Uh, in order to build great fortunes, you have to have a combination of a high rate of profit and a very high rate of saving on that high rate of profit, out of that high rate of profit. Now, uh, another uh, related reason, I think, is that once people uh, accumulate enough wealth uh, sufficient to enable them to live for the rest of their lives at uh, some kind of comfortable level. Uh, let's imagine that uh, you had managed to accumulate uh, $10 million. And uh, looking forward from this point on, uh, uh, you might expect uh, at the outside to be alive for 50 years, or maybe uh, your lifespan, plus uh, some significant number of years of your children. Uh, let's say your time horizon is 50 years and you've got $10 million. Well, uh, what fraction of this $10 million uh, might you uh, be able to consume and uh, make your $10 million suffice for 50 years? Uh, what annual rate of consumption will $10 million suffice for 50 years? 
you have to divide 10 million by 50. 200,000 a year. Okay, so uh, you could afford to consume uh, 200,000 out of your 10 million, and you could live this way for 50 years, even if you didn't earn any rate of return at all. But let's say you are earning a rate of return. Let's say you're earning a 10% rate of return. So now, uh, instead of having 10 million, you have 11 million. Okay, well now you have 11 million, uh, which you want to make do for 50 years. How much more can you consume on the foundation of 11 million rather than 10 million? Two hundred and twenty thousand. Two hundred and twenty thousand. Exactly. Now, what is implied about how much you'll be saving out of that million of income? Zero. You just go ready. Well, you have a million of income. Uh, you are going to be consuming two hundred thousand. Now, an extra million of income leads to an, uh, merely an extra 20,000 of consumption. Yeah. So how much extra saving is it leading to? 980,000. So uh, you can see uh, grounds, uh, 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 to the extent that your rate of return uh, is above 2%, uh, you'll be saving the far greater part of any rate of return above 2%. And uh, the, uh, in, in what, what is the way in which the highest incomes are earned? Uh, the highest incomes in the economy, uh, wages or salaries, uh, the really top incomes. They're profits. Uh, typically, they're profits. And uh, they're high rates of profit. They're not just profits, but high rates of profit. And uh, if this principle is applying, that uh, people who've accumulated some substantial capitals in the first place, that uh, they will be uh, viewing them, uh, uh, using them over a span of years, well, uh, high rates of return on capital are, uh, by, by virtual mathematical necessity, going to be saved very, very heavily. Now, uh, imagine we had someone uh, who has a stupendous amount of capital. Uh, let's say he has a billion dollars, but he's only earning a 2% annual rate of return. <coughs> well, uh, what kind of consumption might he have uh, what kind of saving should we expect him to be doing? Mm -hmm. Well, if he has a billion, and uh, what's uh, two percent of a billion? Twenty, 20 million. Uh, if he's got a billion, uh, he could afford to consume twenty million a year. His billion will last fifty years, and uh, he won't be saving anything if his income is just two percent on his capital. But as his income would be higher on his capital, if his income or 10% uh, instead of 2%, and so he's earning 100 million instead of 20 million, and his consumption is being governed uh, basically by his capital, well, what should we expect him to consume out of his uh, 100 million of income? Uh, a little more, like 22 million maybe, 22 million, and save 78 million. Well, what are the implications uh, for uh, reducing government spending and progressively uh, reducing the maximum rate of income tax? There's more money to go around. What, will, what will be the implications for capital accumulation and economic progress? We have more economic progress and a higher standard of living. But it, it requires that uh, the tax cuts uh, be financed by government spending cuts. and. Uh, you see, uh, starting the tax cuts uh, at this level, uh, this has the maximum impact on uh, the ability to achieve economic progress. Now, uh, these same points I've indicated they apply to the corporate income tax, uh, the progressive personal income tax. Uh, they also apply to the capital gains tax. Uh, the capital gains tax refers to uh, not income, uh, but a capital gain, you've purchased assets at one price, you later on sell them at a higher price. Uh, the difference is a capital gain. Uh, what is the uh, current capital gains tax, Mr. Wilson? Do you know that? It's graduated from 10 to 15%, depending on your bracket. Is 15% the current maximum, or is it yeah, higher than that? current maximum. It's the current maximum. For okay. Long For long, those are gains over six months or over a longer period? Pardon me? Over 12 months, okay. 
Uh, not all that long ago, the capital gains tax went up to uh, 25 percent. Now, uh, what do you think is done uh, with the immense uh, bulk of capital gains? I think they're saved and reinvested. Now, also, you should realize that a huge chunk of capital gains comes about for no other reason than inflation. Uh, what, in, what, what makes it possible uh, for people throughout the whole economy to sell the same assets for more than they paid for them? Well, it's simply that later on, there's more money in the economy, a greater ability to spend, uh, so uh, the prices of the assets are higher. So they have a capital gain. Now, uh, in fact, uh, the capital gains tax uh, is a tax uh, tending uh, to cause decumulation of capital. Uh, suppose, uh, let's say you've bought a home. Uh, you bought a home uh, when new homes were $100,000. And now comparable new homes are 500000 In fact, your, uh, your uh, home that's now 10 or 20 years old that you paid $100,000 for, it's 500000 Okay, uh, how much would you have to spend for uh, another new home currently? 500000 or uh, if it's a fully new home, maybe 600000 who knows? Okay, to whatever extent you have to pay taxes on this capital gain, what is that doing to your ability to acquire a comparable asset? It's reducing it. Uh, you're paying taxes. If you had to pay, uh, say, 25% uh, and you made a capital gain of 400000 well, uh, here you are. Uh, you, you've taken in after taxes 400000 on your home. But what's a comparable home cost you now? 500000 uh, You can't afford as good an asset as you had. Uh, the capital gains tax is actually a tax uh, that serves uh, to decumulate capital. Now, uh, we also have a couple of other uh, 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 anti-capital accumulation uh, taxes. Uh, an important one is the uh, Social Security uh, system. Uh, people are paying into Social Security, and how do they typically regard uh, what the funds they're paying in? They think that they're saving. They're building a nest egg for their retirement. That when they retire, uh, they'll get the benefit of their contributions. Uh, but what is the government doing with the money it collects in Social Security taxes? Spending it. It's consuming it. So uh, if we didn't have Social Security uh, and people are saving, uh, their savings would be going into real capital assets. Uh, Social Security takes the place of much private saving and uh, diverts uh, uh, these funds uh, into current consumption. It causes a significant chunk of what people subjectively regard as savings. It causes them to be consumed. And then uh, we've also already discussed uh, deficits uh, to the extent that the deficits are uh, financed by borrowing from the public. Uh, they're financed at the expense of, of private investment. So uh, between a combination of uh, uh, inheritance taxes, corporate income taxes, the progressive personal income tax, the capital gains tax, the social security tax, government deficits, and then also inflation of the money supply, uh, these are all things that are undercutting capital formation. Now, uh, I want to uh, go into uh, a further special point here uh, concerning uh, how to evaluate taxes and, let's say, different uh, plans for tax reductions. Uh, let me try to bring this up. Let's see if uh, what I'd like to ask you to consider is uh, imagine there is a proposal uh, to cut government spending by one hundred billion dollars and uh, to cut taxes equivalently. But we have uh, two different alternative schemes of tax reduction. In one case, uh, the 100 billion of tax reduction will be spread over 100 million wage earners, each of whom will get a $1,000 tax cut. $1,000 times 100 million, that's 100 billion. 
Now, uh, let's look at that uh, from the perspective of uh, our own material self-interest. Uh, what part of that tax cut uh, would personally benefit any one of us? Pardon me? You said $1,000? Yeah, there's a total tax cut of $100 billion, but uh, under one scenario, it's divided over 100 million wage earners. Each of them gets a $1,000 tax cut. And presumably, we're included, you and I. Okay, uh, what would be uh, your uh, direct personal benefit from this tax cut? A thousand dollars. Okay, now we need to evaluate uh, what is the effect on any given individual wage earner of the uh, tax reduction of ninety-nine billion nine hundred ninety-nine million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand going to the other ninety-nine million, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, wage earners. Probably no. I would say minimal. Uh, maybe uh, you and your drinking buddies can afford a few extra beers, and so you'll have a little bit more of, of socialization that way. But uh, there is no significant economic benefit uh, to you uh, from the tax cut on all of your fellow wage earners. You do get a benefit from the tax cut on you, but that's not 100 billion, that's 1,000. Now, uh, compare this with an alternative uh, tax cut where uh, you and I don't get any tax cut. Uh, the $100 billion tax cut uh, goes to uh, uh, reducing the corporate income tax or the inheritance tax uh, the kind of tax uh, that uh, the recipients will, uh, that the beneficiaries uh, will very heavily save and reinvest. Uh, is there any significant effect on you of other people's saving and reinvesting? No. I would say there is. Now, is it possible that if you're considering your own self-interest, it's certainly true that there is no better tax cut from the point of view of any one of us than our own personal tax cut? But that's only $1,000. That's not uh, all that much. The other $99 billion plus, plus, plus is of no significant benefit to us. But $100 billion of taxes, uh, going, uh, of tax cut going to those who would very heavily save and invest it, that could be of cumulative progressive benefit by virtue of increasing the demand for capital goods relative to the demand for consumers' goods, uh, increasing the concentration on the production of capital goods, also raising the demand for labor. Uh, I would say it is not at all unreasonable uh, to conclude that uh, this tax cut is more to the self-interest of the average person than the tax cut that goes directly to a large mass of average people. But, as I say, these considerations are almost universally ignored. Now, there have to be some people who are aware of them, otherwise we wouldn't have uh, tax cuts like this ever proposed. But uh, they're certainly not making the case uh, in the media. I hope, if nothing else, I'm giving you the ability uh, to uh, look at taxes in a different light than you may have. Yes, uh, Mr. Feldman. So I just had a question as it pertains to these, and I don't know if you could comment on this, but these propositions, yeah. 68 and 70, when you see these commercials, the government uh, say don't vote, yes. You see on the other side, they're saying that the Indians have to pay their taxes. Any comment there on... on which is which? I've, re I've read brief accounts of all of them, but... There's just two major ones. One of them is tied to the Indian handling mm -hmm. and the ability to have them pay taxes. But the government's saying that they want to negotiate their own taxes with them and not to vote for the proposition, which is special interest. Mm -hmm. Voting yes on 68 and 70 guarantees a 25% tax from the Indian gaming industry. Now, there's, what's the difference between the two of them? I don't know that we got through. But, uh, one of them. Then, uh, the government's position, or Arnold Schwarzenegger's position, is vote no because he wants to negotiate uh, more money out of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the dark downsides, evidently, is that it will allow uh, the Las Vegas interest to put many casinos on uh, wide number of land, a great number of lands that are so-called Indian lands in uh, already developed areas of Southern California, or all of California. So, okay, so the Indians want us to vote yes. 
Are oh, you saying the essential features uh, of the proposition is uh, it will raise taxes on the? Uh, no, it'll just that right now I don't think they're taxed. Are they taxed much? No, they're not taxed. No, because, because, because of the, the, the reservation clock. Right, but it will, it will impose taxes, but not as much as, uh, as the governor yeah, and others. Likely, yeah. All right, well, I think I would have a little bit of difficulty deciding on that one. Uh, I would automatically vote against any proposition that's raising anybody's taxes. Uh, so uh, to that extent, I'd probably vote no on this. So uh, I guess I just vote no because it's a rise in taxes. Right. Okay. Now there was another one, uh, what, 68? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're confusing because the way you see on the commercial, you know, the, the pro, the advocates of it want you to vote because we're going to get all this money, you know, given back to the state. But then on the flip side, you know, the fire department, the police, and the governor say that that's a big lie. We're not going to get money. Um, all they're going to have the ability to do is to build these different uh, things and, and uh, more or less take away from our schools and create pollution. And, so I don't know. Uh, uh, it's it's a, it sounds like a very mixed bag. On the one side, uh, they're going to have to pay more taxes. But on the other side, it's opening up freedom of entry into gambling, at least. Yeah, like that. Okay, so that, that I would say, while I personally don't gamble, uh, I think there should be economic freedom for those who like to do it. But uh, I don't want to vote for anything that raises taxes. I think I've decided, uh, on the basis of what I've seen, I'll probably vote against all the propositions. If you were to propose a tax yeah. program, yeah. What would, would, you, would it be uh, along the flat tax line, where it's like, 15% flat tax for everybody, no matter what the income, or, well, and there's no, or that or the accountants be too upset because that eliminate a large part of their job. Well, I, I first of all say about a flat tax, uh, that should never be the stopping point. That might be a, a way station. I think that would probably be better than what we have today. But uh, the ultimate goal should be the total elimination of the income tax. Uh, that would take a long time. Uh, there would be a number of things required. Uh, first, it's very vital uh, to achieve economic progress. Right. Now, just imagine that uh, we had a movement uh, whose first main goal would be to freeze real per capita government spending at its present level. They might not even be able quite to achieve that. Uh, there might be existing government programs that have it built into them that, that their liabilities are going to get greater automatically. But uh, the barest minimum should be that we don't add anything to what the government is already doing. And uh, that's the main thing I hold against President Bush. Uh, his uh, advancement of this uh, prescription drug benefit. Uh, there's absolutely no reason to add this on. This will cost extra trillions of dollars over the years and probably end up destroying the drug industry. The barest minimum should be the government doesn't do anything beyond what it's already scheduled to do. We don't add anything. Uh, the next step is that you have to have uh, the ability to achieve economic progress. Now, just imagine that uh, we could make a, a sufficient in initial move that we uh, cut government spending somewhat, uh, cut the most destructive taxes, so that we achieve a, a somewhat better rate of economic progress. And we have to reduce regulation substantially. Uh, suppose we could achieve a rate of economic progress of 3% per year. Uh, what would be the implication of the relative size of the government in one generation? If the economy as a whole were growing at a compound annual rate of 3% a year, how, much, how long does it take for the economy to double? Well, about 25 years. The rule of 72, uh, 25 years roughly. But if we had a doubled economy and real per capita government spending frozen, what would that do to the relative size of the government in one generation? It would cut it in half. It would cut it in half. That would be a, a major part of any solution. And uh, along the way, we could be uh, starting to phase out different government programs, uh, start uh, reducing uh, the income taxes, uh, work the highest brackets down, and maybe get to a point at some point uh, where we have a flat tax. But that shouldn't be the stopping point. Uh, we should be working uh, to steadily reduce uh, even the flat tax until it goes away. Now, there's no government program that couldn't be eliminated, uh, no welfare-type program, 
and uh, if anyone is interested in further discussion, uh, you can read chapter 20 in my book, which is not assigned, but uh, I do lay out a program uh, for the achievement of a fully capitalist society. All right, let me turn. Pardon me? Okay, all right. Well, I think there are a lot of good, there are a lot of good ideas in Chapter 20 on how to phase all of this out. But it would take uh, uh, more, more than a generation uh, to really do it. You can't achieve it uh, overnight or even in one four-year term. Uh, you need uh, a dedicated political movement that has an agenda uh, that it's uh, trying to achieve over a long period of time. And the, the initiative until now has always come from the left. The left has a program, uh, they advance it, uh, they don't get it through, that doesn't stop them, they come back the next time, then the time after that, until they finally get their way. But uh, you need uh, something comparable on the other side. All right, let me turn uh, to the subject of private ownership <coughs> of land. Uh, there are many people, I shouldn't say many, but there's a significant number of people uh, who think that uh, private ownership of land uh, represents a special case. Uh, uh, there is a group of economists uh, uh, who appear to be in favor of uh, free enterprise in every respect other than in connection uh, with land and natural resources. Uh, there was a well-known American economist in the 19th century named Henry George. Uh, there are Henry George schools in different major cities. I don't know if there's one in Los Angeles. Uh, there is or used to be one in New York. Uh, they have uh, uh, an economics journal. Uh, in some other countries, uh, they're more influential. I think they have uh, a significant number of seats in the uh, Danish parliament. Uh, their ideas have uh, some significant influence on uh, government policy, uh, even in places like Canada. Uh, the net upshot is uh, uh, to favor uh, government ownership of land and natural resources. And uh, the basis of uh, this uh, special advocacy of government ownership of land and natural resources uh, goes back uh, to the doctrines of David Ricardo, I uh, was perhaps the uh, greatest of the classical economists, and he developed a doctrine on what he called land rent, land rent. Uh, Ricardo lived in Great Britain in the, early, uh, in the early 19th century, and at that time, and perhaps even today, uh, most of the land was actually rented. Uh, there would be a class of landowners, uh, they'd own the land, and then they would rent it uh, to farmers, uh, let's say on a 20-year lease or something like that, a long-term lease, and the uh, farmers would actually be paying a land rent. Now, uh, Ricardo uh, developed his doctrine in a way uh, to make it applicable to all land, even uh, in, all in the United States where the uh, great bulk of the land uh, is operated by those who own it. And uh, what his doctrine was, uh, was uh, it rested on a differentiation of land of different uh, qualities. And I think we have probably had some discussion of this already in connection with the law of diminishing returns. Uh, now let me give you a, a, a quick a con condensed version of Ricardo's doctrine. He starts off by asking people to imagine uh, a thinly populated country uh, with a great abundance of land of the very best quality, that he calls land of the first quality. And there was a real world candidates for this in his day, and that was uh, the United States. The United States was a thinly populated country with a great abundance of uh, very high quality land. Well, uh, Ricardo said that uh, in such conditions there would be no land rent. Uh, people might actually pay a rent uh, uh, for land that had uh, buildings on it and various improvements, but uh, these rents would merely be uh, covering the costs of constructing the buildings and providing a rate of return on them. Uh, there would be no payment for the use of the land as such. Uh, no payment for what he sometimes described as the original indestructible powers of the soil. Well, uh, what would bring about payment for the use of the land as such? Well, what would do that, he said, was uh, suppose the population of this territory increases. 
and we reach a point where all the land of the first quality has been brought under cultivation. And now the best remaining land is land of the second quality. At this point, he, he argued that rent would commence on land of the first quality. Now, how would this be? Well, let's see. Uh, here we are. Uh, we have uh, a unit of labor uh, uh, produces on. We have, uh, I'm sorry, uh, different qualities of land. On land of the first quality, a unit of labor produces 100 units of output. And uh, if, if we have an abundance of unused land of the first quality that's freely available for the taking from nature, uh, no one will pay rent for land. But suppose now all the land of the first quality is under cultivation, and new cultivators have to resort to land of the second quality, where the same amount of labor uh, produces an output of only 90. Well, in these circumstances, would people become willing to pay anything for the use of the better land where their output would be 10 units greater. Here you are, your alternative is, you can produce 90 on land of the second quality and you pay no rent. Or uh, you could produce 100 on land of the first quality, but to do so, they have to offer an inducement to the landowner to let you uh, use that land. How much would you be willing to pay uh, for the privilege of uh, producing on land of the first quality? What would be your maximum limit? Up to 10. So uh, wh when it becomes necessary to resort to land of the second quality, Ricardo argued that at that point, rent commences on land of the first quality, and there will be a rent of up to 10. And he argued that this rent would be present implicitly uh, even if land of the first quality were worked uh, by its owners. Uh, suppose we have uh, two sets of workers. Uh, they're equally good workers. Uh, one set is working on land of the first quality, the other is working on land of the second quality. Uh, one set of workers is producing an output of 100, the other is producing an output of 90. Well, in Ricardo's view, uh, the extra 10 would be attributable to the use of the better land. There would be something that would be the product not of the worker's labor, but of the fact that uh, he worked on better land. And that 10 of extra output, uh, in Ricardo's view, would be a land rent that the worker received in this case, but it would still be a land rent. It would be uh, the measurement of the land's specific contribution to the output. Okay, suppose population increases further, and now all the land of the second quality is brought into cultivation. And where must people now turn? Land of, the, land of the third quality. At this point, Ricardo says, rent commences on land of the second quality and increases on land of the first quality. Because now you'd be willing to pay 20 uh, to farm on land of the first quality and 10 to farm on land of the second quality. There'd still be no rent on land of the third quality. Now, a closely related doctrine of the early classical economists uh, was known as the iron law of wages, uh, which was the notion that uh, population tended to increase uh, up to the point uh, where because of the need to resort to land of inferior quality and uh, the concomitant operation of diminishing returns, uh, we'd reach a point uh, where the additional labor would produce a product just sufficient to keep the cultivators alive. Uh, and let's say uh, what the cultivators need uh, to stay alive, uh, what the farmer needs uh, for himself, his wife, and two replacement children, suppose that is an output of 80. Well, uh, then are we in a position in such a society uh, to cultivate land of the fourth quality, which gives you an output only of, of 70. No, th this would set a limit to population. Uh, this uh, goes closely uh, with the doctrines of the Reverend Malthus, who is a contemporary and a friend of Ricardo's. Uh, he advocated the uh, principle of population, uh, the notion that population tends to grow up to the limit of the food supply, and that's here at 80. So here we are. Uh, people are earning only 80 bare minimum subsistence uh, in reward for their labor, and uh, we have rent of 10 on land of the second quality, 20 on land of the first quality. Now, what if uh, we got uh, some economic progress? Suppose we get uh, some economic progress. 
And as the result of this economic progress, uh, the same quantity of labor is able to produce 110 on land of the first quality, 100 on land of the second quality, 90 on land of the third quality, and 80 on land of the fourth quality. Uh, what do you think the lasting ultimate effect would be uh, on this analysis of Ricardo and Malthus? Yes, Ms. Fox. The population could increase up to land of the fourth quality, but the rents would stay the same because you increase by the same multiple. Okay, uh, the population could now increase. Uh, uh, people could survive cultivating land of the fourth quality because it yields minimum subsistence. But uh, once uh, we had to resort to land of the fourth quality, uh, what would, where, would the, where would people be by virtue of their ability merely to work? How much would they earn merely by virtue of their ability to work? How much do the cultivators of land of the fourth quality earn? Pardon me? Below substance. Well, 80 is subsistence. Uh, they're back to subsistence. And what do people working on lands of better quality, what do they make by virtue of their labor as opposed to their possession of better quality land? 30. Pardon me? 30. 30. Now I'm asking, what do they make, what does anyone make uh, just by virtue of his labor as distinct from uh, any advantage he gains by the ownership of better land? They're all making just 80. By labor. Now, even if you are producing on land of the first quality and uh, your output is 110, uh, how much of that, uh, according to this analysis, would be attributable to your labor and how much would be attributable to your good fortune of possessing land of the first quality? 80 would be attributable to your labor and 30 uh, to your possession of the land. Now, uh, notice what's happening uh, to the uh, significance of land ownership here. Uh, as we get to land of the fourth quality, uh, the total output is 110 plus 100 plus 90 plus 80. I think that's 380 altogether. What fraction of that is land rent? Well, you have 30 on the first quality land, 20 on the second quality land, 10 on the third quality land. So rent is now accounting for 60 out of 380. Uh, previously, it accounted for 30 out of uh, uh, 300. What's happening to rent as a percentage of the uh, total output of the society? Well, it's growing. And that was one of Ricardo's uh, doctrines. He thought uh, that as uh, societies grew richer, uh, rent uh, would, command, would represent an ever-growing share of the produce. And where would the average wage earner be? Where would the average person be by virtue of his ability to perform labor? They'd be always ending up at subsistence. All progress would be temporary. Uh, we have some increases in production, but then what's the further result? Population grows, and uh, we're back at the margin of subsistence uh, with a bigger population. And who pockets all of the fruits of progress? Well, the landowners, the landowners. So in what light do the landowners appear uh, on this analysis? Are they uh, made to appear as contributing to the progress? No. Now, what is their relation to the progress? They're the only ones who are lastingly benefiting from it. Right. Uh, the landowners do nothing. Uh, they sit back. Uh, they wait for population to grow up. Uh, to raise rents, and uh, they are the parties that gain uh, from the fruits of progress. Now, it's on that foundation that uh, Henry George appeared later in the 19th century and argued uh, for uh, the government uh, taxing away uh, these land rents. And the leading doctrine of the Henry George School is that uh, uh, the economy, the society could be run on the foundation of a single tax uh, derived from the proceeds of land rent. It's known as the single tax movement. Now let me say that, and uh, this is point two, uh, that this doctrine uh, seemed very well to fit the facts uh, of the uh, 500 years uh, prior to Ricardo. 
Uh, if you look at the period 1250 to 1750, over that 500 year period, uh, there was some uh, significant progress, but it was very, very slow. If you look at the uh, buildings in Western Europe uh, that were constructed in the middle of the 18th century, and you compare them to the middle of the 13th century, there was dramatic improvement. Uh, they had uh, much better uh, furniture, clothing, but who had these things? How different was the standard of living of uh, whoever had to live uh, simply on the foundation of his labor uh, in 1750 compared to 1250? I, I don't think very different at all. Uh, where was the, pro into whose pockets uh, did the progress go in that era? The into the landowners. Uh, it was the landowners and also uh, the particular merchants and artisans whom the landowners patronized, they were the ones who got the benefits of uh, the economic progress that took place. So uh, this is why I say uh, the doctrine uh, seemed applicable uh, to this period, and uh, you can understand why uh, someone like Ricardo uh, would propound it. Uh, his historical experience was of that era. Uh, he was born in 1772, he died in 1823, and uh, the progress of the Industrial Revolution was uh, too recent uh, to be taken for granted. Ricardo had some awareness of it. Uh, sometimes he uh, made concessions that uh, real wages uh, could con continually rise, uh, provided we had sufficient capital accumulation, but he wasn't at all consistent uh, on this. Now, uh, these uh, uh, historical facts, uh, as I say, are taken as uh, justifying uh, the opposition to uh, private ownership of land and natural resources, the notion that the landowners uh, just passively sit back and do nothing and collect the uh, fruits of economic progress. But I'd like to point out that uh, what makes that kind of scenario possible uh, is the fact that economic progress is going forward at too slow a rate. See, if we had economic progress creeping along at the minuscule rate uh, between 1250 and 1750, so that it takes 500 years uh, for substantial developments to occur, uh, that is a, a rate of progress that can be nullified by population growth. And that's what happened again and again. Uh, population growth uh, continually offset the economic progress, uh, at least from the point of view of the average worker. Uh, what's needed to prevent that, and what started uh, in the latter part of the uh, 18th century with the Industrial Revolution, was a much more rapid rate of economic progress. And when you have this more rapid rate of economic progress, sufficient to outstrip the population growth, uh, then you don't get a tendency towards subsistence wages. Uh, we've had uh, huge increases in population. Uh, the population of the United States uh, in 1790 was about 4 million. Today it's 384, uh, 284 million. Uh, that's a huge increase. Uh, the population of Britain uh, in the same period was below 8 million. Uh, now it's uh, well over 50 million, uh, similarly uh, with many other countries. So we've had uh, huge increases in population and uh, uh, even greater increases in the standard of living. And the reason is uh, that uh, economic progress has occurred at a much more rapid rate. Now, uh, the main uh, point I want to make here is that a crucial element uh, that's required to have the more rapid economic progress is precisely private ownership of land and natural resources. See, it's not true that uh, if you have private ownership of land and natural resources, uh, the owners simply sit back and pocket the gains and do nothing. Uh, the problem uh, that, uh, that underlay uh, the growing importance of land rent in the uh, period 1250 to 1750 was not that we had private ownership of land and natural resources, but that we didn't have very much of it. We had inadequate uh, private ownership of land and natural resources. And when we got more, which started, uh, uh, which went forward uh, very heavily in the 18th century, 
in a number of ways, and then in the early 19th century. Uh, in uh, the 18th century and in the past, be before that, in uh, most of Europe, uh, you had feudalism. Uh, the feudal landowners, the, the feudal lords, were not landowners as we understand the term. Uh, they were, a better comparison would be uh, to hereditary commanders of military bases. Uh, the economic theory of feudalism was that property did not belong to any living individual, but to a bloodline. So uh, the uh, Duchy of Burgundy or whatever, or the County of Artois, uh, that would not be the property of the current Duke of Burgundy or Count of Artois. That would be the property of his bloodline, belonging as much to his unborn great-grandchildren as to him. Now, what would that imply about your ability to sell the land? You couldn't. It's not yours. Uh, it also limited your ability to pledge it as collateral. You couldn't do anything that would forfeit the land. You couldn't even lease it out in France uh, for more than 14 years. Uh, in Britain, uh, the, the system was not quite that onerous, but uh, in Britain, uh, you had a widespread common ownership. Uh, there were villages that owned pastures and forests. Uh, the land uh, being farmed by people uh, was broken up into separate strips, and that was also true uh, on the continent. But in the 18th century in Britain, uh, there was a movement called the Enclosure Movement, a kind of privatization movement of its day that created compact private farms that amalgamated separate strips that privatized uh, the communal pasture lands and, and forests, made them into separate private property holdings. And this was the foundation of a tremendous increase in productivity in agriculture. It made possible uh, selective animal breeding, uh, scientific farming, uh, this is one major development. Uh, another uh, major development was uh, the French Revolution. Uh, the French Revolution overthrew feudalism in France. Uh, then Napoleon carried it throughout much of Western Europe. And it then became possible for the first time uh, for land holdings to change hands, uh, to have a real market in land. Uh, under feudalism, uh, you could not uh, uh, sell the land, as I pointed out. Uh, you also couldn't put serfs off the land. We know that under serfdom, the serfs couldn't leave, but the other side of that was the uh, feudal lords uh, couldn't put them off the land either. And not being able to put them off the land, uh, what would something like that do uh, to the incentive uh, to adopt labor-saving improvements in agriculture? Incentive. No incentive. All right, now, an even bigger development in uh, privatization was the settlement of the United States. Uh, the United States, uh, in the first uh, 50 years of the 19th century, uh, moved from settlements along the eastern seaboard to west of the Mississippi River. And what was the uh, pattern of ownership of this uh, very important piece of real estate? It virtually all became private property. Now, when you have private ownership of land and you respect the property rights of the owners, that creates the incentive basis for rapid economic progress. And if you have sufficiently rapid progress, the uh, increases in production f more and more offset the increase in population. Uh, we avoid this problem of population increases nullifying the benefits of economic progress. And you can see this happening uh, through the 19th century uh, imagine uh, you could have a time machine and go back uh, first to 1750, and in 1750, your job would be uh, to locate uh, the source of wealth of the 500 richest families in Britain, a kind of 18th century Fortune 500. Where do you think their wealth would be connected? What would it be connected with? What would be its source? Commerce. Land ownership. In the mid-18th century, land ownership. But what about in 1850? What would be the, the source of the wealth of the 500 richest families? Industry. Industry and commerce, no longer land. And uh, the incomes derived from land ownership were actually going down. Uh, in the late 19th century, the uh, British nobility had to look for American heiresses uh, to enable them to keep up their castles. Uh, they could, their earnings were declining. Uh, the prices of crops were going down. Just think what was happening. We had railroads, steamships, uh, the American Midwest was opening up, uh, the price of agricultural commodities were going down, 
uh, land previously farmed was getting thrown out of cultivation. A lot of land in Britain went back to pasture. Even land in New England went back to pasture because it couldn't stand the competition of better lands in the Midwest. And we've continued rapid progress in agriculture on the foundation of private ownership of land. So my point here is that the real effect of private ownership, of uh, unrestrained private ownership of land is to serve to minimize land rent. See, the, more, uh, the greater the increase we have uh, in agricultural commodities and minerals, what's the effect on the price? Drives it down. Uh, what's it do uh, to the extent to which we need to cultivate? It actually reduces that. We don't need as much land. What, is this, what does this do to rent? Reduces it. Now, if you want a final confirmation, uh, practically out of the newspapers, uh, think of what the effects would be on the price of oil and on the income derived from the ownership of oil deposits if we respected uh, private property in land uh, much more than we do. Suppose we allowed for the extension of private ownership of land. Suppose we allowed the privatization of the continental shelf and we respected the rights of the owners so that if there's oil there, they can bring it out. And we privatized the wildlife preserves and, uh, and wilderness areas. And if there's oil there, it can be drilled. What would be the effect on the price of oil? Look at that. What would be the effect on the incomes derived uh, from the ownership of oil fields, like in Saudi Arabia? That would go down. And if we allowed the strip mining of coal, uh, the development of atomic power, what would that do to the demand for oil? Go down. What would be happening to uh, land rents uh, derived from the ownership of oil? Go down. So respect for private property rights in land minimizes land rent. The more we uh, disrespect private property in land, the more we restrict it, the higher will rents go. And uh, that, I'm sorry to say, uh, will be the net outcome uh, if the environmental movement continues to succeed. Uh, it combats uh, practically every improvement uh, in productivity pertaining to land and mineral deposits. It wants to rule off uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, uh, the undersea. Uh, it fights uh, herbicides and pesticides, uh, practically anything needed uh, to increase output of uh, uh, agricultural products and minerals. And the result is we're locked in uh, to a limited base and uh, the rents uh, will tend to rise unless this policy is reversed. Okay, we've reached our uh, regular limit, so we can draw a line here. See you all next week.